We're in the book of Judges, and if you're wondering why we're in the book of Judges tonight, or chapter 8, I should say, tonight, it's because last week, or the week prior to that, we were in Judges chapter 7. And so what we like to do here, our trademark here at Recovery House of Worship, SoCal actually, is to take you guys through the Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, because then two things happen. Number one, uh, you don't hear me speaking, but you hear the Lord speaking to you. And number two, you receive the power of His Word that we know transforms a life. All right? So we are in the second part of our series on a profile of a spiritual warrior. Okay, part two of our series, uh, Profile of a Spiritual Warrior. And uh, men, young men, older men, married men, single men, pay very close attention because if you are the man of your house, or someday you will be the man of your house, then make no mistake about it, God sees you as the pastor or the spiritual warrior of your house. Your house will rise and fall depending on what your relationship is with the truth of the gospel. And if you're a single mom at home, then God has elected you to be the pastor of your home as well. And so there's going to be a lot of things that God is going to tell us in the second part of this chapter tonight that are going to, um, that you will need, I should say, to, to apply to your life. And let me just refresh your memory. And those who weren't here two weeks ago, let me just tell you a little bit more about where we're at. Forgive my cough. I got this crazy head cold right now. But in chapter 6, when we got to chapter 6 of the book of uh, Judges, we met a guy named Gideon. And we also met some people, some enemies of Israel that were called the Midianites. And what these Midianites would do is they would come in and they would raid that area where God's people were at. Okay? And all of this took place because God's people rejected God. They, they exchanged God for idols. Okay? What they did is they got into idolatry. Idolatry is what? Idolatry is whatever we put in front or before, give priority to our relationship with Jesus Christ. That is uh, idolatry. Look at that. We got a straggler in here. I thought he was with his babysitter. <laughs> Welcome, sir. <laughs> <coughs> By the time we got to verses 12 and 15 in chapter 6, we see that God chose Gideon. God chose Gideon to be the judge over his people. And surprisingly, kind of, because Gideon is nothing more than a humble farmer. Okay? And we're going to learn some more things about Gideon tonight that we didn't get in chapter 6 and in chapter 7. Because it just doesn't tell us till we get towards the end. Sometimes God likes to do it that way. But Gideon, being a humble farmer, was also the guy that the Lord chose to lead his people in battle against these Midianites who were formidable. And we know from history that the Midianites were the first people to ever use camel in warfare. Did you know that? They were the first people to ever use camels in war. There were horses and probably other animals as well, but camels. So they, they perfected that form of, uh, of, of war. And then in chapter 7, we saw that uh, Gideon chose 32,000 soldiers to go against the Midianites. He was outnumbered. I think at that point it was like they, one to four. But then God came along and said, Gideon, you still have too many. And Gideon said, well, what would you have me do, Lord? He said, I want you to take 300. We're going to sort them out. I'm going to leave you with 300 because 32,000 is too many. And if you use the 32,000 and you go into battle and you succeed and you have victory, then what's going to happen is you're going to give yourself credit for the victory. And my people are going to stumble all over again. So God knows the nature of our flesh. Always wanting to take credit. Always wanting to be somebody famous, right? But God always does more with less. And you find that all throughout Scripture. Because the book of Isaiah says, His ways are not our ways. His ways are higher, right? In other words, to put it in Mario's vernacular, God is smart. Not, we're not so much. Right? God's very smart. We're not. We like to think that we're smart, but that's usually not the case. When we measure ourselves against God's intellect, we, we find out different. And so now in chapter 8, 
We're going to see the profile of a Christian warrior. A profile of a Christian warrior. And last week in verses 1 through 17, we saw a warrior's love and compassion for his people. A warrior's love and compassion for his people. We saw his supernatural passion and his supernatural strength. Uh, Gideon was able to do some things that uh, some people might say are not really actually physically possible. But he did it because he was under the influence of the Spirit of God. And then we saw him in his willingness and his ferociousness actually to confront traitors. To confront traitors. We talked last week about the book of Revelation. And as you go through it, you find out early on in church history as, as, uh, as chapters 2 and 3 describe. Early on in church history, Satan always came at the church and attacked the church from outside the camp. But then you get into to some of the, 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 the second and third or the third and the fourth uh, historical chapters of, of, of the church. And then how does Satan attack the church at that point? From the inside. And he's been doing it like that ever since because he has had more success attacking the church from the inside than he ever had attacking it from the outside. And we know even today, like the church in China and other churches in Africa and other places in the world where the church is under attack and they're facing persecution, the churches aren't smothered out. They actually grow. But where the church is free to grow, where the church is free to exist, like here in America, the church is dying. So God and His church always seem to operate in a backward uh, form. So what we're going to talk about this week is a warrior's hate for God's enemies. A warrior's, a Christian warrior's hate for God's enemies. And I don't mean that we should hate our enemies as the gospel tells us not. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about a warrior's hate for God's enemies in the way of Satan, his demons, and all of the stuff. That they pull and they put on us where they just actually rip families apart and entire nations and people. They're brutal. They're hostile. They're merciless. And we should hate them. You're going to see that tonight. It's actually biblical. We're going to talk about a warrior's humility and a warrior's flaws. So those three things we're going to talk about tonight. A warrior's hate for God's enemies, his humility, and his flaws. And so... By the time we come to verse 18 of uh, of chapter 8, we see that Gideon has defeated the Midianites. And he captured the two kings, Ziba and Zalmunna. And let me tell you, write it down if you're taking notes. These two guys are a picture. They are a type. They represent your flesh and my flesh. Your sin and my sin. Okay. So when you read the Old Testament, you want to read it in that light or you'll never understand what's going on. Okay. So King Zelmuna and King Ziba represent our sin and our flesh. If you read the story that way, you're going to understand a lot more about what's going on there. And our flesh and our sin are and have always been the enemies of God because our sin and our flesh are forever evil and up to no good. You say, Mario, there's one good thing about me. And I say, hold off until you get into Scripture. Because God would say, there is not one good thing about us unless that one thing is of Him. And we have to come to terms with that. Otherwise, we'll never have a relationship with God that He's desired that that we have with Him. And Romans chapter 12, verse 9 says, We should abhor. Romans chapter 12, verse 9 says, We should abhor. That is, we should hate everything that is evil and love everything that is good. Right? That's the New Testament. We're in the Old Testament. That's the New Testament. And how many know that the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed and the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed, right? So you can't really understand one without the other. So you may see me going back and forth uh, from time to time. And so what we see in the Old Testament and what we read in the New Testament is that our attitudes and our actions towards sin and the flesh should be total hatred and total anger. We should hate our flesh. And we should hate sin. If you, if you speak Spanish, we should, it should give us asco. Asco in Spanish, right? It should gross you out. I think that's a 
I think that's uh, you know I think that, that carries over, right? If you're if you're an addict, or if you ever met a heroin addict that's been clean for thirty days, and you light up a, a match to light your cigarette, you watch that guy. He's gonna he's gonna heave because the smell of the sulfur is gonna make him sick. Because we use matches to cook that stuff up and we're not doing it anymore. There is this physical backlash. We hate it. We heave, right? Or if you ever go to a restaurant with my wife and there's seafood there, she will tell them, listen, make sure that nothing that you cook my food with has been used to cook seafood, right? Make sure you don't bring any fish or shrimp or anything because she'll break out, her throat starts closing. She has an allergic effect, right? That should be our attitude and our action towards sin. But you know what the problem is? We love sin. We love sin. And that's been the problem ever since the beginning, right? So that's why in, in, in 2 Peter uh, verse 2 or chapter 2 verse 22, Peter says that after leaving sin, if we ever go back, it's as though a dog would return to lick up its vomit. It's sickening. It's sickening. Right? We need to see our sin that way and, and, and our flesh. Well, Gideon understood this when it came to the enemy. Okay? Zima and, and, and Zalmunna. He understood this uh, well. And so in verses 13 to 21, he applies this, his, this hatred when he takes inventory and goes in there to clean house. In a very particular way. In a very particular way. And you're going to see why. Because again, some things are revealed here in chapter 8 that weren't revealed in chapter 6. So let's pick it up there in verse 13. Uh, Judges chapter 8 verse 13. It says, Then Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from battle from the ascent of Hears. And he caught a young man uh, of, 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 of Succoth and interrogated him. And he wrote down for him the leaders of Succoth and its, and its elders, 77 men. Then he came to the men of Succoth and said, Here are Ziba and Zalmunna. About whom you ridiculed me, saying, Are the hands of Ziba and Zalmunna now in your hand, that we should give bread to your weary men? And he took the elders of the city, and thorns of the wilderness, and briars, and with them he taught the men of Sukkoth a lesson. Then he tore down the tower of Pinul and killed the men of the city. So last week... In verse 5 of the same chapter, if you remember, Gideon killed most of the opposition. But now he's chasing down the survivors and he's really tired, him and his guys. If you go to Israel with us, I'll show you how far they ran. It was many, many miles that they ran chasing these guys down in the middle of the desert. And they were very tired and they were very hungry. So these guys from Sukkoth and Peniel, these were his people. These were Israelites. And he went there, if you were here last week, and he said, hey, we're tired. We're chasing our enemies. Okay, Not just my enemies. They're your enemies too. Do you mind? You can you pour us a glass of water. Can you give us some bread, something to eat, so that we can continue in pursuit? And they said, no, we won't do it. And last week we talked about it. And the reason they wouldn't do it is because they weren't sure that Gideon would have the victory. So they said, hey, you don't have the two kings with you. How do we know you're going to win this war? They don't want to be vested with the wrong party. Right? So what does that make them? Makes them traitors. Right? And if they're traitors and they're not siding with, with, with their own people or the enemy, but just to you know, see who the victor would be, then they are really helping the enemy in all reality. And so Gideon told them, okay, you keep your food, you keep your water, but I'm going to come back and I will have the victory because God already told me that I would. And then I'm going to deal with you, right? And so he does. He comes back now. He's got the two kings in his uh, uh, possession, right? And now he follows through with the threat that he made. And so what he does is he beat the guys, the men of Sukkoth, with those briars, with those thorn bushes. And if you read it in the original language, he actually beat them to death. And then he went over to the guys of Penuel, or, uh, Penuel and he killed the leaders of that village. Right? And so now, in verses 18 through 21, Gideon is going to deal with the enemy. And notice his method, because it's personal now. And we don't get this until chapter 8. Okay? So, verse 18. 
He says, and he, that's Gideon, said to Zeba and Zelmunna, these are the two kings of, of Midian, right? That represent what again? Our flesh and our sin, right? And he said to Zeba and Zelmunna, what kind of men were they whom you killed at Tabor? He's interrogating these two guys, right? So they answered, as you are, so were they. They said, each one resembled the son of a king. And then Gideon said, they were my brothers, the sons of my mother. As the Lord lives, if you had let them live, I would not kill you. And he said to Jether, his firstborn, his son, rise and kill them. But the youth would not draw his sword, for he was afraid because he was still a youth. So Ziba and Zalmunna said, rise yourself, Gideon, and kill us. For as a man is, so is his strength. So Gideon arose and killed Ziba and Zalmunna and took the crescent ornaments that were on their camels. So now we know why in chapter 6, when we met Gideon, we know why he was alone. We know why he was in fear and why he was in the cave hiding with his wheat. It was because these guys, with all their Midianite soldiers, all their Midianite army, came into the camp as they would annually to take whatever they want. But at one point, they went in and they killed all of Gideon's brothers. They wiped out his entire family. So we didn't know that in chapter 6, but we now know that in chapter 8. And so Ziba and Zelmuna again, are a picture of our sin and our flesh. And they murdered all of his brothers. Well, what we see here is what we see consistently all throughout the Bible. Okay. Who do Ziba and Zelmuna represent? Our sin and our flesh. And what we see throughout the whole Bible is that wherever and whenever our sin and our flesh rule over a nation or a family or a ministry or a business or the workplace, there will be, make no mistake about it, nobody is an exception to the rule. There's going to be casualties. Wherever sin and the flesh rule, there's going to be casualties. And in this case, it's all of Gideon's family or at least all of his, uh, his brothers. And how many families have I met they were entirely devastated by decisions made because of sin and the flesh. And all you see are the remnants. And it's a mess. Mom or dad went out and had an affair. One or both of the parents were on drugs. Somebody got involved in gangs. You know, they allowed the children to go out and have sex with the boyfriend or the girlfriend. Now children are born. You know, who do they belong to? Should we abort the baby? Should we keep the baby? Let's give it up for a dog. It's a mess. Wherever and whenever sin and the flesh rule a home, a family, a ministry, a business, a nation... It's going to be a mess. There's going to be casualties. Never think that you might be the exception to the rule. It's not going to work for you. It's never worked for anybody. You know, about I have a big family. And um, some of my cousins I haven't seen in years. And I learned last year, my mother actually told me, that one of my cousins uh, at some point moved to Fresno, married a guy, and they bought a bar together. They bought a bar in Fresno. I mean, you know, crazy. And uh, so they, you know, they're running their bar. They're doing their thing, probably making some money, I would imagine. But one evening after the bar closes, her husband, who I've never met, he was kidnapped, robbed, murdered, and left in a field over there. That is the result of their decision to open a bar, to run a bar, right? And so you say, well, why were they owning a bar? What, what, whatever gave them that idea? You know what gave them that idea? The absence of Jesus Christ in their life. In the absence of Jesus Christ in your life, the worst idea will seem like the best idea. Because as we mentioned before, it's like going through life with a broken compass. What direction are you going in? I'm not sure, but it feels good. Well, it feels good now. But what happens when you get there? I don't know. There's going to be destruction. It's going to be a mess. Your life's going to be jacked. And listen, if it were just you and it were just me, that's one thing. But sometimes it's generation after generation after generation after generation. 
and it's a mess. God would have never wanted it that way. But Jesus Christ was absent from the equation, right? So, Ziba and Zamuna represent sin and the flesh, and they ruled in Gideon's camp for a while. But now, Gideon, not going to put up with it no more. He's going to make a move, right? And so he's going to kill both of them, right? But notice uh, what he says first in verse 20. Go back there. It's, he's, uh, he says to Jether, his firstborn. So this is Junior. This is his eldest son, right? He says, Jether, my son, you kill him. Right? So there's probably Gideon. Jether, his son, I don't know, some of the soldiers. And there's these two kings. Why does Gideon tell his son, you kill these two guys? Why do you think that he would do that? Well, remember this. Gideon is not the only warrior in the picture. Ziba and Zalmuna, evil that they are, they are warriors. And you know what happens to a warrior? Because of pride, because of ego, because of you know, all of those... Um, fleshly desires and fleshly thoughts. A warrior, one of the things that's always in the back of a warrior's mind is how they're going to die. How they're going to die. They want to die in a way that is going to leave a legacy behind. So if you are a mighty king that has led hundreds of thousands of soldiers into victory in battle, the last thing you want the New York Times to say is that some killed, some kid took your life. That's why they said, why don't you kill us, Gideon, Mr. Experienced Leader, Mr. Experienced Warrior, right? You understand that Gideon hated these guys so much that he not only wanted to kill them, he wanted to humiliate them before he killed them. Another picture of what should be our uh, attitude towards sin and the flesh. Humiliate it. Kill it. Get rid of it today. I've, I've mentioned the story before. You know, where we live, we have a lot of uh, rattlesnakes. Every summer, I kill two, three, maybe four of them. Small ones, big ones, you know. And I cut the head off with the shovel. But the first time we found one, uh, my son, Lorenzo, I don't know where he's at. He was playing in the backyard, way in the, we have a big yard, way in the back. And he jetted in to the, through the kitchen door, out of breath. And I said, what happened? He says, a snake, there's a snake. And so I went back there, and it was a, a baby rattlesnake. And so I had a big cookie jar like that. And rather than kill him, this is the first rattlesnake I had seen, I put him in the, in the jar. I said, well, I'm going to impress my friends, right? And I put the lid on there. And I had him for about two days. Every time somebody went to the backyard or if our dogs went back, any motion, that thing would just strike. And you could see its fangs and it would hit you know, the, the, the wall of the cookie jar. Sah, sah, and you could hear the rattle. It's vicious. And I said to myself, if I don't kill this snake, this snake's going to kill somebody in my family. And so I let the snake out and I took his head off. That is the only way to handle sin. If you play with sin, it's going to bite you and or somebody that you love. Sin is not to be played with. It's not a toy. It's not a laughing matter. It's a very serious thing, right? So we should hate sin and we should hate uh, uh, the flesh. And so we also want to see what the root of all of this sin and the flesh is really about. What is at the root of it all? It is something very deep and something very dark. More than we'll probably ever know in this lifetime. What is it? It's Satan. He really does exist. There are people today, and there are even, I'm ashamed to say, there are even pastors today that are preaching sermons and writing books telling people that hell doesn't really exist. That Satan doesn't really exist. Oh, it's just your dark side. You know, in effect, by doing that, that they're calling Jesus a liar. Because Jesus said there is most definitely the existence of Satan. Jesus said there's most definitely hell. Jesus preached more about hell than he ever did of heaven. Now, take count the next time you read the Gospels. So there is a hell and there is a real Satan. Make no mistake about it. And so Satan is at the root of our flesh and our sin. 
Right? And in this particular case, it's mentioned here, but you've got to look a little careful. Sometimes when you're studying the Bible, you've got to go to the original language, Hebrew if it's the Old Testament, or Greek if it's in the New Testament. Right? And here in verse 21, he talks about the crescent ornaments that these guys had. Now, keep in mind that we're going back about 3,500 years to look into this event. It's about 3,500 years, okay? So, <clears throat> it says that Zeba and Zalmunna had these crescent ornaments around the camel's necks. In the Hebrew, it is saho, sa, sahoronim. Sahoronim. That is these crescents that are being described here. And it happens to be the same crescent that you see on top of any mosque. And so in Israel, we had the opportunity to go to the Dome of the Rock. You'll, if you go with us, you'll, you'll, you'll get to go there. And that's where you see on television that golden dome. You've probably seen it on the news whenever there's war or fighting. Okay. On top of that is, a, a, I don't know, like this, this, it's, it's a monument. It looks like a monument. And there's this round ball. And then on top of that is the Fertile Crescent, which tells you that it is a temple to the Muslims. Okay. And so... That is what is hanging from the necks of these camels. It is that fertile crescent. And so what that tells us is that Zeba and Zelmuna in the Midianites, thousands of years before you ever heard of Muhammad and Islam and Muslims, were worshiping the moon god. So when you talk about that crescent, you say, wait a minute, where have I seen this before in the Bible? And now you go all the way back to the beginning in Genesis chapter 12, when Abraham was in Mesopotamia, and God said, I want you to leave your family and your people and your gods. Who was the God back then? The fertile crescent. See, so that whole Islamic thing is not a new thing in, in, in any way. And so Zeba and Amuna were worshiping this God, but he wasn't called Allah back then. Back then they called him Al Ilah. And what they were referring to was the moon God. And so in Gideon's day, that's what they called him, Al Ilah. Later on in Arabia, we find out that he's called Al Ilah with an H at the end. And then about 1400 years ago, 800 years ago, something like that, uh, Muhammad will call him Allah. And what is different about Allah and their whole beliefs in the Quran today, what Muhammad made different about it is that it's now a monotheistic God. He is one God. Okay, prior to that, throughout history, he was a polytheistic God. So there's the crescent moon and the, 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 the moon God, which consists of a lot of gods. Muhammad said, that's it. He's one God. Monotheistic. So if you go with us to the Temple Mount, and we go to that Dome of the Rock, and you see the Golden Dome, and that thing that protrudes from it, there is that round ball, and then the Fertile Crescent. On the round ball, if you get some binoculars, or just get up as close as you can, you're going to see on there, okay, that it says, Our God is one God, and He has no Son. Is what it says. This is a slap in the face to Israel and Jewish people because the Dome of the Rock sits on the Temple Mound where the Temple of God used to be. Right? And so all of this can be traced back to you know thousands and thousands of years ago. One thing you find when you read the Bible is that Satan has no new tricks. What he does is he repackages. He repackages, right? And so this God is the ancient God of the enemies of God's people. He's been around for a long, long time. Where did it begin? Where did these people, when were they born? Where did they come from? Remember the story of Abraham? Abraham's wife was who? Sarah. And God told Abraham and Sarah that they were going to have children that numbered like the stars in the sky or like the sand of the seashore. Remember that? But then Abraham and Sarah said, uh-oh, we can't have babies. Right? So they prayed for a little while and prayed for a little while. Still couldn't have babies. And Sarah says, look, Abraham, God means well. He loves us. We know He loves us. But He doesn't have the power to give us babies. Let's help Him out. So they get Hagar, who was the mistress. 
And Abraham has a baby with her. And the baby's name is Ishmael. And Ishmael is the father of the Arabs who become the Muslim people. Who become the ancient enemies of God's people. And they remain the enemies of God's people uh, today. And for thousands of years, Satan has made attempt after attempt after attempt to use these people to annihilate not only the Jews in times past, but today even the Christians. Right? So they are the ancient enemies of God's people. And at this point... We can see that the book of Judges is even a prophetic book because in the book of Judges, God told His people when they got to the promised land, the book of Joshua, what did He say? When you go into the promised land, you are to wipe out everybody that is there. All of them. Leave no stone unturned. Did they do it? They failed. They failed and they had a better idea. So they left some, and those remnants remain today. You know what's interesting? If I had a map, I could show you. It's interesting. So if you go with us to Israel, they say, okay, we're going to Bethlehem today. We're going to see the birthplace of Jesus. And then we're going to drive there, right? But when we get to the checkpoint, our uh, tour guide is going to step out of the bus, and a new tour guide is going to step in. Our tour guide that was in the bus at first was Jewish. Our tourist guide now is Palestinian. Because our tour, Jewish tour guide is not able to go in there. Right? Those areas, uh, the Golan Heights, um, the, uh, the, the West Bank, and a couple of the areas in Israel that are still occupied by the Muslims today, are the very same areas that were occupied in Gideon's day by the same people. It's amazing how history repeats itself over and over and over again in one way or another. In the way we see it when we obey God or the way we see it when we don't obey God. Right? God means what He says. God says what He means. So, the, God's people suffer uh, from the uh, persecution of these people. And continue over and over again. There's going to come a time when that whole population is going to be extinguished. And that's going to be when the Lord's return. But of course, it's not yet, right? And isn't that just like our sin and our flesh? If we don't kill it today, it will evolve and it will continue to create the same problems for generations to come. They say, oh, it's a generational curse. And I say, man, you're not a victim. You're a volunteer. You had the opportunity to put your sin and your flesh to death, but you didn't do it. And now all your children and your grandchildren are suffering because of it. Right? So, verse 22. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us both you and your son and your grandson also, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. So Gideon killed these two kings. He goes back home. They say, Gideon, you are the greatest. You know, if you have a good teacher, when you get involved in ministry, a teacher will say, don't ever believe your headlines. Don't ever believe flattery. Okay? Your flesh is still no good. Right? Because people, you know, they talk to you, they pat you on the back, you're some great guy. You're not. You're not. Right? So they're flattering, you know, pouring flattery on, on Gideon. And they want him not only to be the king, but they want a dynasty. They said, even your son and your grandson after you will rule over us. Right? But Gideon is not only a warrior, he's still a humble farmer. So he turns it away. He says, I will not rule over you. And I love this because it's a picture of ministry. It's a picture of ministry. You know, if you're a minister of God's word, if you're a pastor, if you're a preacher, whatever you're a teacher, whatever you want to call it, you are you don't exist for people to minister to you. You exist so that you can minister to the people. You don't rule over the people. You serve the people. But at the same time, if you're going to be effective the way God wants you to be effective, you don't become a codependent. Right? It's our job to take your hand and put it in the hand of the Lord and walk away. If we're not doing that, then we're making you dependent on me. And I'm sorry, but I can't help you. There's no way that I could do for you what God can do for you. 
And so from time to time, I meet people and they're calling me way too much. And they're coming over my house way too much. And they're looking for me way too much. And I say to myself, I'm becoming their God and I'm not going to take their phone calls anymore. And then they get mad at you. But that's between them and the Lord. That's not my job. I will not become their idol. And I say that because as you guys begin to grow and mature in your relationship with God, people are going to lean on you the same way. Don't go for it. Get out of the way because God will break your leg. He's not going to allow you to be God to somebody that He loves. That's not what ministry is about. And there's a picture of that here, of course, with, uh, with, uh, with Gideon. And so... In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, Paul said, We don't have dominion over your faith, but our fellow workers for your joy. For by faith you stand. Hey, listen, we're all the same. Maybe one or the other knows a little bit more about the word. Maybe we're gifted in one way that you're not. But we're all equal. We're all equal. We're all just God's uh, family. And so Gideon is a humble warrior. But in the next verses... We're going to see his flaw. Okay? You ready for that? Some people, they see, they meet me. They, oh, Mario is the great. Have you ever heard anybody teach like Mario? Oh, he prayed for, you know, he put oil. And I felt the spirit. <laughs> and they keep coming back. And they keep coming back. And they see me yell at my wife. And I just fell off the pedestal, man. <laughs> All of a sudden, the anointing is no more. Mario's just a natural man. And I say, man, I told you that from the beginning. So I'm not going to your church anymore. Huh? It's not my church, but okay. You don't have to come, you know. So every, <coughs> every warrior has a flaw. So it says in verse 24, Then Gideon said to them, I would like to make a request of you. Gideon's flaw. That each of you would give me the earrings from his plunder. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. So they answered, We will gladly give them. And they spread out a garment, and each man threw into it the earrings from his plunder. Now the weight of the gold earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold, about 43 pounds of gold. Okay, that's what this guy's asking for. <coughs> This was besides the crescent ornaments, pendants, and purple robes, which were on the kings of Midian, and besides the chains that were around the camel's necks. Then Gideon made it into an ephod and set it up in his city, Ophrah. And all Israel played the harlot with it there. It became a snare to Gideon and to his house. Thus Midian was subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted up their heads no more. And the country was quiet for 40 years in the days of Gideon. Then Jerubbabel, if you remember in, in chapter 7, when he tore down the altar, they changed his name to Jerubbabel. Then Jerubbabel, who was Gideon, the son of Joash, went and dwelt in his own house. Gideon had 70 sons who were his own offspring, for he had many wives, there's the flaw, and his concubine who was in Shechem also bore him a son whose name he called Abimelech. And if you've read forward in the ninth chapter, you say, oh no. Now Gideon, the son of Joash, died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of Joash, his father, in, in Ophrah. Uh, of the Abyssalites. So this ephod, we just talked about this in our Bible study when we're going through the book of Leviticus. It is the vest that the priest wore. Why Gideon decided to make this vest out of the gold, nobody really knows. But what we do know is that the people ended up worshiping this thing, which is so typical. Because whenever God uses a person, place, or a thing, or an object to save His people, His people end up worshiping the object rather than the one who gave it to them. And I'm going to say this. And if you're in recovery, oh, I can't believe He said it. I'm saying it. Many, many, many drug addicts have gotten clean in 12-step programs. Rather than worship the God who gave them the 12-step program, they worship the 12-step program. And it's what people have been doing since the beginning. 
And pretty soon, they have no time for anything else but that program. You say, Mario, you hate that program. No, I don't. I'm a member. But let's get real. Let's get real. No man did that for me. It was God who did that for me. And if I'm going to worship the men who are, I'll call them leaders of the program, famous people, the ones that sit on the pedestal, then I become just like the people of Gideon's day, worshiping the object rather than the God who gave it to save my life. It makes no sense uh, uh, at all. Well, it seems that every warrior has his flaw, and Gideon is no exception. Let's be real. The dude loves money, and the dude loves women. Can you identify? (laughs) Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand, especially if your wife's here. (laughs) In verse, in verse 24, wow, the read says. In verse 24, he asked for 43 pounds of gold. In verse 26, he had already taken all of the gold ornaments, the pendants, and the chains. And then verse 30 through 31 says he had many wives. We were not sure how many. But he has 70 sons plus one son with the concubine. That's like the mistress or the girlfriend. And his name is Abimelech. Listen, multiplying wives is never, ever, ever good. I have some of these knuckleheads, man. They tell me, Mario, what's wrong with having more than one wife? You know the Bible. Come on, tell me. The Bible doesn't say. Okay, if maybe the Bible doesn't say don't have many wives. But what you read about the men who have many wives is they have many headaches. Right? (laughs) They have many headaches. And if they have children from all of these wives, the children end up killing each other. And that's what's happening uh, uh, right here. We're going to find out in chapter 9 that this son of the concubine, this guy Abimelech, he's going to kill 69 of his half-brothers in one day on one rock. That's what happens with mixed families. Especially when the parents start to get old and they talk about the living trust and what are they leaving behind and why is so-and-so, you know, getting more than so-and-so over here. And they start warring, and then there's hate and animosity. It all comes to the surface. Why? Because there's not, you know, one set of children from one mom and dad. It's dad plus three ex-wives or whatever. Or the other way around, right? It never works. It never works. God wants every man to have one wife. Just like the doves, just like the penguins. Forever, all throughout life, right? It's a good thing. It's a good thing, you know. <clears throat> My wife and I, uh, we're getting old now. You know, we're in our mid-50s. And I've seen, I love my wife. I have seen so many guys, man, that go through, you know what we call a midlife crisis? You've seen them, right? The, 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 the 65 with the convertible Corvette. The shirt's open with the big gold chain, right? <laughs> the, the, big, the big hair, right? And some 22-year-old says, oh, you're so strong, you know. You're so good looking. Does your wife tell you how good looking you are? And this sucker goes for it, man. And there's no love there. You know, not always, but most of the time. And it's a mess. It's another mess. You know, love the one you're with for all your life. God will bless that. And the generations after you. um, You know, if, I want to be careful how I say this. If my kids ever get married, okay, And issues come up. Issues come up in marriage, right? Hopefully, they will consider their mom and dad and never mention the D word. Because mom and dad went through hell and never got divorced. Hopefully, that word is absent from their vocabulary. Because there's problems in marriage, but God is there to deal with all of those things. Right? And listen, if you're divorced, God forgives. There is grace. Get on with your life. Move forward. But stay with the one you're married to now. Right? It's the best thing. It's what the Lord wants. If there wasn't for Jesus Christ, there'd be no forgiveness. And we're all messed up. Right? But Jesus Christ heals. So let's finish it up. Verse 33. It says, So it was as soon as Gideon was dead that the children of Israel again played the harlot with the Baals and made Baal Bareth their God. They returned to idolatry. 
Thus the children of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side, nor did they show kindness to the house of Jerubbabel, that's Gideon, in accordance with the good that he had done for Israel. So in Gideon's day, the people of God suffered because of the sins and because of their flesh, and they also apparently suffered from amnesia because they forget so quickly, right? You know, it was not our idea to have church every Sunday. That idea came from the first church in the book of Acts. So ask yourself, how come God didn't make church for one day a month? You know, or once a year? Why does God make church every Sunday? Oh, and then these pastors put a midweek service in there for Bible study. Why do they do that? You know why? Because we know that just like us, you guys forget. You forget. Come tomorrow, you know, I don't know what kind of work you do or whatever, but you're going to get on with your daily business, and you're going to forget all about what we talked about here. right? But if you keep coming back consistently, it's going to be locked into your mind. And then you're going to say, wow, I remember 10 years ago, my life was going in this direction. Now I'm going in this direction. And there's so much good in my I own a home now. I'm still married to my wife. We have more children. I got a raise at work. I own the company. All these blessings come. But if you're not consistent, 10 years will pass. You look back and you say, wow, my life hasn't changed a bit. Right? So if we keep coming back and we're consistent, we grow in our relationship with God. And 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 says, All these things happen to them. That is the people in Gideon's day. As examples for us. And they were written for our admonition or our warning. Upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So the story is not here just because God felt like, well, let me tell a story. This is a true event. It actually happened. And the lessons that we could learn from this, God would desire that we learn them so that we don't repeat the same mistakes, which is what we call insanity, right? Repeating the same mistakes, expecting different results. You scream that out on every corner and people still do it, right? And... And they blame people, places, and they say, no, it's you, it's you. <laughs> Let's pray. And then I think Jennifer's going to close us out with a song. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your beautiful word. Thank you for these beautiful people that you brought here tonight. Father, I pray your anointing of joy and gladness and sufficiency and blessing on their lives. Father, may you smile on them day after day throughout this week and bless them to the point where they won't even believe it themselves. And bring them back, Lord. Continue to bring them back as we grow together in your word. Thank you for your presence here tonight. In Jesus' name.